Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in Her Office. In this video, I'm going to give you the formal definitions of the semantics for the term languages for syllogisms that we've been introducing. In the previous video, I gave you some of the informal background and ideas behind what we're going to do, and now we're going to make things precise. So let me bring up my whiteboard so that we can go through the nitty gritty details to make clear all of the kind of wishy-washy things that we saw in the previous uh, previous videos. So I've got a definition up there already. Let L be just any term language whatsoever, because we're giving you a general definition and we're giving you a general definition of this notion of interpretation. So an interpretation is a function that goes from the set of basic terms of the language to non-empty sets of objects. Now, cast your mind back to the set theory video that we did oh, some videos back, the idea of a set is that it's just a collection of objects. So when we are constructing an interpretation, all we are doing is taking the individual categorimatic terms of the language and associating them with sets of objects. That's all there is to it. However, we get to write it down in a fancy way so it makes it look like it's all kind of slick and professional. For instance, we had the informal idea of a language that had E and H and um, D and O for elves and dwarves and hobbits and orcs and all of these things. Well, let's do a slightly simpler version of this. So definition, let L3, because it's the third language that I've introduced to you, be a term language uh, consisting of just three categorimatic terms. So E, H, and W, and then the usual four copulae. But as I said, we will talk about the interpretation of the copulae in another video. We can then define an interpretation of L3 simply by saying, what are the objects that are associated with each of these terms? And I'm going to introduce a particular type of notion. So we're going to have new notation. This I is our interpretation. And then we put the thing that we're interpreting it in parentheses. And then we have an identity between the interpretation of E and a set. Now, this is the sort of set where we are going to explicitly list the members in it. So for our purposes, the set is going to be the one that contains Elrond, Galadriel, Legolas, and Arwen. Yes, I know there are more than those four, but for the purposes of interpreting this language, we're going to consider elf to mean one of these four. Then we can say what the interpretation of H is. This is going to be Frodo, Sam, Mary, and Pippin. Oh, why not? Let's be, so we've got different numbers of objects in each of them. Let's put in Bilbo. And then we have the interpretation, oops, not D, W, Take it mnemonically, these are the wizards. So here we have Gandalf, Radagast, and Saruman. Now, this is not a particularly interesting interpretation because as you'll see, each one of the basic terms is completely disjoint from any of the other ones. So if you pick any two of these sets, there's no element that's in both of them. So pretty much the only thing that we would end up being able to say in this language is things like no, uh, no hobbit is an elf and no wizard is a hobbit. Not very interesting, but this is just for the purposes of examples. Now I'm going to clear this completely so that we can do something a little bit more complex. Now, when I wrote down what I, uh, how I interpreted hobbit and elf and, uh, uh, wizard, wizards, not dwarves. I was using real world knowledge in a sense, well, real Middle Earth knowledge to be able to know what goes into each of them. I'm still kind of am 
relying on this intuitive connection between the language and the, the, the interpretations. So let me give you something else where we don't have this sort of connection. So let's L4 be the term language consisting of, again, the four, non, uh, the four logical copulae because we always have those. But then we have just the uh, categorimatic terms A, B, and C. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and define these interpretations. The interpretation of A contains Julia, Fred, and Lorne. The interpretation of B just has Julia in it. And the interpretation of C is going to be Adelia, Lorne, and Fred. Now, you don't have any idea what sort of pre-theoretic interpretation or meaning of A, B, and C I have in mind. You don't know anything about Julia, Fred, Lorne, and Adelia. But wait, you do. Because what you know is that Julia is both A and B, and you know that she is not C. And you know that Lorne is both A and C, but not B. And Adelia is only C. So what you can start seeing are the relationships between the members of the sets. And that is what is going to matter more than what really does A mean in this case, or who Julia, Fred, Lorne, Adelia are. That isn't what matters here. What matters are the fact that we can look and say, aha, in A and B, we've got something that shows up in both of them. We also have something that shows up in A, but not in B. And these are the relationships that we're going to exploit when I give you the truth conditions for the categorical connectives, the copulae, the logical vocabulary that stays fixed no matter how we interpret the non-logical vocabulary. So that is going to be semantics part two, where I give you truth conditions for the categorical propositions. So we are done with our whiteboard for now, and I look forward to seeing you for my next video. Cheers.